uh, you know, giving uh, going too much into uh, you know sort of some introductory comments or uh, background. Let me begin uh, immediately uh, with my presentation. Um, I have titled the talk India's Energy Challenge in an Unequal and Warming World uh, because looking at and thinking about uh, energy, energy requirements uh, for the future uh, for the country uh, in the context of climate change with what is happening uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, the increases in, in global surface temperatures and the increasing pressures to mitigate, to take climate action, to mitigate climate change, uh, to, to mitigate further increases in temperature, as well as adapt to the changes that are already happening. This year has been particularly, uh, has seen some particularly severe extreme events across the world, uh, not just in the global south, but also in the global north this time. And so the, uh, the, the voice is asking for rapid urgent immediate action have become uh, louder and as uh, we head for uh, COP26 which is to happen uh, in a couple of weeks which is starting uh, very soon uh, in the UK uh, I think we have uh, uh, this becomes a very important discussion to have at this point. So let me begin with uh, with some of the results from the most recently re uh, released report of the IPCC. This is the report of the uh, working group one uh, for the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. And there are some important advances in this report as compared to earlier assessments of the IPCC, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, some uh, of them emphasize the earlier results and, uh, uh, you know, earlier findings much more strongly. Some provide more nuance and uh, you know, extend our understanding of uh, the a particular problem and what is needed to address it. So we now know, uh, of course, that the world has warmed since pre-industrial times by about one, a uh, little over one degree Celsius, and a large part of this uh, uh, warming is really because of human influence. Let me just. Uh, so the total human influence is really quite significant. And of course, the largest contributors are the well-mixed greenhouse gases. Uh, some of this I'm going to assume that some terms are, uh, you know, uh, this is an en Oxford Energy series. So of course, a lot of the audience is perhaps uh, conversant with some of the terms that I'm going to use here. Uh, of course, if there are any clarificatory questions, I will, uh, you know, answer them to the best of my ability towards the end of the talk. But what we see from this image is from the IPCC uh, report of the first working group. Uh, this is from, in fact, somebody for policymakers uh, in that uh, report. And uh, so the impact of the well-mixed greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases, which is basically carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, uh, is quite significantly high. Uh, we have some human drivers that also have masked the warming by a cooling effect, largely uh, aerosols lead to this kind of an effect, and you have other natural variability as well. Right. And so uh, what this report also gives, uh, tells us, and this is uh, from what the IPCC calls multiple lines of evidence, we now know and can attribute uh, warming to specific greenhouse gases as well. And so carbon dioxide, for example, is uh, of course uh, something that we've always known, is the largest contributor uh, to the warming that we see so far, uh, quite significantly so. Uh, methane and nitrous oxide also are significant contributors, but, then, but you know, some of the impact of the short-lived gases, uh, while it is extremely important, gets balanced out almost, uh, uh, again, quite significantly by some other greenhouse gases which, are, uh, which have the effect of, uh, in fact, the, these aerosols have a cooling effect. And so you have a negative radiative forcing that you see here on this graph. So this is, you know, the largely the picture that we see of about 1.07 degrees with some uh, sensitivity, of course, that is shown here by this bar, by, by this, by the little bar that you see here. Uh, we have warming of about one, over one degree Celsius. 
And this is due to cumulative emissions uh, from pre-industrial times that uh, are, you know, have been emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, now, this is again a result uh, which is uh, quite significant of the IPCC. This was first, of course, published by in the in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. And so we have uh, uh, the, there is a relationship that is establishes between cumulative emissions and uh, maximum surface temperature, uh, global surface temperature rise. So it is with from these results what we see now and what we know now is that it is not emissions trajectories or the flows of emissions but the cumulative stock of emissions in the uh, in, that has been emitted so far that has a direct almost linear relationship with uh, total warming so therefore we can in fact say that the historical cumulative emissions that we have so far which is about 2500 gigatons of carbon dioxide between 1850 and 2019 are responsible for this uh, one degree Celsius warming that we see. And so similarly, since we can say this about the past, we can also say this about the future, that we have a total budget, which is uh, basically uh, uh, th that we have, that the world as a whole has, beyond which we cannot emit cumulatively, the world cannot emit more than this budget, so that the total uh, rise in temperature is limited below either 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial times. And so, you know, uh, you know, corresponding to a certain probability of limiting that temperature rise, we have a value of the total carbon budget. And so if you add the 2,500 gigatons of approximately 2,500 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide to what is remaining for the future, so that temperature rise doesn't exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius with a very high probability, at least an 83% chance that it will not exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius. Then we have a total budget of 2,800 of which 89% is already over. So 89% uh, this part of the pie chart is basically past cumulative emissions. All the emissions from 1850 to 2019, that much is already over. What we have left is only 11%. And similarly, we have these numbers for different probabilities. What, probab what kind of probability of limiting temperature rise are we willing to live with? Right. So uh, are we OK with the 50 percent probability? Then we have a remaining carbon budget of 500 gigatons of carbon. So 2500 in the past and only 500 left for the future to be able to limit the temperature rise to the to one of the Paris Agreement targets, which is 1.5 degrees Celsius. Right. That's the more ambitious target that that is in the Paris Agreement. And of course, we have a similar number for 2 degrees Celsius as well. For 2 degrees Celsius, we have slightly more room. We have a slightly higher budgets. Uh, of course, for uh, slightly, you know, for higher probabilities of 2 degrees Celsius, meaning we have, we want a very good chance that the temperature will not exceed 2 degrees Celsius. And this is really what the Paris Agreement says, that we'll try to limit temperature rise to well below 2 degrees Celsius. And so there we have, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about an 83% probability. And for that, 74% of the carbon budget is already over. So it corresponds to about 900 gigatons of carbon is what is remaining for the future. 2,500 has been emitted, 900 gigatons of carbon is what is remaining for the future. And so we need to look at uh, what the, the, unfortunately, while this is a result that is, I mean, these numbers are from the IPCC report. They are from the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, both the past emission numbers as well as uh, what is remaining for the future. The report very clearly says that while net zero, I mean, you know, the total budget is basically uh, from when you from 1850 till global net zero emissions are reached. So you need to go to zero. But it's not simply enough to go to zero. If you want to go to zero while limiting temperature rise to either 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, then you have a finite carbon budget which you need to stay within. Okay. 
and the focus on net zero and everybody is uh, you know applauding these net zero declarations of 2050 20 you know 2060 by china uh, 2050 by uh, eu uh, 2050 by the us etc but how does that square with what is remaining of the global carbon budget if you look at the numbers it is quite clear that with the pledges that we have 1.5 degrees celsius is no longer alive and i use this terminology because the cop presidency uh, has spoken about keeping 1.5 degrees celsius alive right so we want to make sure that everybody pledges to uh, pledges commensurate climate action so that we can at least attempt to limit temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees celsius which means we have very very little space carbon space left for the future we have we have to go to zero much, much before 2050. And so therefore, while uh, countries have declared 2050 targets, the pressure is on other countries to declare similar targets, which means if we take those as given that, OK, countries will reach net zero sometime in the middle of this century, it means that we are not going to limit temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, because this is what we need. For even a 50 percent chance, that we will limit temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. The world needs to go to net zero by 2039, by, by you know about a little before 2040. This is for a 50% chance. Okay. But if we just take what is remaining for the future, forget what has happened in the past, etc., etc. Just take what is remaining for the future and what the world needs to do. Now, if the Annex One countries, which is the developed countries in in the in the UN uh, in the UNFCCC uh, lingo, the Annex One countries need to, in fact, therefore, if they have to stay within a fair share of this remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees Celsius, they have to go to net zero well before 2030. They have to go to net zero in this decade. The non-annex one countries, which India is a part of, uh, you know, all the non-developed or less developed countries, uh, as classified by the UNFCCC, need to reach net zero by around 2045. This is what we need. The 2045 targets that have been given by developed countries should be targets for the non-annex one countries, and annex one countries needs they need targets of that are well that that commit to net zero in this decade. This is what you need for a 50% probability of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we are nowhere close to that. If we take individual countries, this is what the US needs to do. The US needs to go to net zero in 2020, 2024. That's, that's in 2023, in fact. That's, uh, that's in the next, next two years. The EU and uh, you know I apologize, but uh, you know this is uh, EU 27 plus the UK uh, needs to go to net zero by 2034. That's before 2035. Okay. China needs to go to net zero again around the same time by 2035. That this is if everybody has to stay within the fair their fair share. This is a simple per capita fair share of what's remaining for the future. So this is what we we need. And the pledges that ha are, have been forthcoming so far are far from what we have. And this is not even considering what I have shown here does not even consider historical responsibility. The fact that some countries have uh, have emitted more in the past, other countries have emitted less and need to therefore need some flexibility. All the principles of differentiation, um, uh, the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, that principle which is enshrined in the UNFCCC. Uh, if you keep all of that aside and just look at what's happening in the future, this is what would be required. Uh, but if you take what has happened in the past, then uh, you know the, the it, it's very clear that that some countries need to take even more urgent action. So till 1990, approximately the time when the UNFCCC came into being, uh, was ratified, uh, the Annex 1 countries, the developed countries, accounted for about 71% of the cumulative emissions to them. The picture hasn't changed very drastically in the years since then. If we take all of the emissions till 2019, it's 61% of the cumulative emissions. And India's contribution has been 5% to the total cumulative emissions. 
So we have, uh, you know, what I have shown here and on the left side is a carbon debt or credit. Uh, so you take the total fair share of the total budget uh, or, or the total past emissions. You take the fair share of that, those total past emissions and subtract the actual emissions from the, that. So you get a negative number for the US for EU because they have used up much more than their fair share. And this is a known story. What you see on the right is the monetization of that fair share at $50 per ton of carbon dioxide. This would mean that the US owes a carbon debt of about 22 trillion US dollars. EU owes about 11 trillion. The UK owes about 4 trillion and so, uh, so on and so forth. And India is owed about 17 trillion. Right, so this is the, the the story of carbon debt is well known. Uh, it's been well, it's been written about. It's there in the literature. Uh, it becomes uh, important because the the entire discussion on this net zero story seems to forget that that uh, you know there has been a history to the negotiations where repeatedly differentiation and the need for differentiation, the need for equity has been emphasized with good reason and so i mean i have uh, uh, you know said this so i'm not really going to uh, spend too much time here because i need to move on to the next section of the presentation uh, but this i wanted to sort of set up a context here uh, so this are, so if we actually take for example consider the full historical responsibility and now i'm talking about not even 1.5 degrees celsius i'm talking about keeping two degrees Celsius, because it's clear that with the current pledges of the developed countries, the two degrees Celsius target is also barely alive. Forget keeping 1.5 degrees Celsius alive, even two degrees Celsius is barely alive. If we take an 83% probability, a very high probability of limiting temperature rise to below two degrees Celsius, and consider full historical responsibility. That, that the developed countries have to give back what they have taken. So you take a fair share of the total carbon budget, then it would mean that the, that the developed countries, Annex 1 countries as a group, would actually have need to have negative emissions starting now. There is nothing left for them to emit in the future. They'd have to have negative emissions starting now. If you grandfather all of past emissions and say, okay, let's just, you know, uh, the, the developed countries like this language uh, of you know have a forward looking narrative we only look at the future grandfather all that has happened in the past all the past emissions you still need the developed countries still need to reach net zero way before they have proposed to reach it if we take somewhere we take the middle of the two if we take a middle path and say that okay we'll 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 allocate what's left for the future not negative emissions but weigh it with some historical responsibility. Then what we get is uh, that Annex 1 countries as a whole have to reach net zero before 2030. There's some differentiation within, within those countries, but as a group before 2030, net zero must be achieved. And yet you see this is what has been proposed as the year of net zero. Of course, Australia hasn't proposed anything, but uh, uh, the others have proposed somewhere close to 2050. The earliest is 2040. Uh, and so on. So, so we are far away from uh, meeting the temperature targets. What does this mean for India, where 18% of the global population lives? Uh, we are responsible for about 4.5% of the global emissions so far, that is emissions between 1850 and 2019, and yet there is tremendous pressure to do more. Right. Uh, if you see all of these uh, in the last couple of months, there have been different agencies that have put out ratings, climate performance ratings, uh, have uh, ranked countries by how well they are doing. And a lot of the uh, countries, I mean, that were that uh, were, have been some of the biggest defaulters on pledges. You take the US, you take Canada, who have constantly shifted goalposts, have promised and then withdrawn from those promises, right, beginning from Kyoto, uh, right up to the Paris Agreement, suddenly start looking good because they have proposed some net zero target way into the future. I mean, you know, uh, 2050, uh, when where it makes no sense because it's neither commensurate with the 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius target. And yet there is pressure uh, to do more on India, enhance your uh, nationally determined contributions, declare net zero by some year or the other. 
But what does this imply? What are the challenges? I mean, uh, you know, it, and as we go towards the COP, there's going to be more and more. There are going to be articles uh, in the media, basically uh, talking about how India is not declaring, resisting, enhancing its NDCs, declaring net zero targets. But there are real challenges involved here. And what are these challenges? I'm going to speak about it a little bit. But before I go to energy, let me just give a small picture about what is the problem of putting India in the same because it is and Radhika spoke about this when she introduced uh, the topic, this tension between India being a, a big emitter uh, in absolute terms. And even there, uh, actually, if you see the difference between uh, the, the emissions of India and the US or EU put together, EU27, it's quite significant. But putting India up there uh, is a problem because here is what the uh, situation is in terms of development, right? Um, you have a per capita GDP. This is in PPP terms. Uh, India is quite uh, below a lot of the developed countries and even uh, below in terms, even lower than a lot of the emerging economies. Uh, but if you if you take other indicators as well, and uh, this is HDI, for example, again, there is a huge significant difference between India and the other countries, and we have a long way to go in terms of ensuring well-being. These are some of the indicators that go into determining uh, human development. And so you have life expectancy, which is also significantly lower in India. The mean years of schooling are lower. Um, uh, the Infant mortality rates are lower, and this is, uh, uh, you know, so, some of the work on doing these kinds of comparisons and uh, arriving at some values of what is therefore needed in terms of energy is work that is ongoing that I'm doing with a with a student uh, a student of mine is doing that that I am uh, collaborating with her on. So if you actually look at uh, India, India is right here, and so we have a significant developmental challenge. But what kind of energy requirements for the future does this imply? It's very difficult to actually say, uh, you know, we can come up with a whole lot of bottom up uh, energy studies and there are some and, you know, I will talk about some of these targets. Uh, we have a large number of studies that talk about what India's energy growth will look like in the future. And you have some international comparisons that are possible in terms of what have countries achieved. Uh, you know, high income countries, high development countries, where are they in terms of energy consumption? If you look at the first set of uh, you know, bars here, you have per capita energy use. India is right at the bottom. Uh, and there's a there's a huge difference uh, between the other countries shown on this uh, graph and India. What you have in the second graph is per capita electricity consumption. Again, India is quite uh, at the bottom. The third graph is the interesting one where you have per capita fossil fuel consumption and this data is for 2016 and it's still quite low for India. So if you look at fossil fuel consumption and because there seems to be, uh, you know, quite a focus on uh, uh, coal as of now, but even natural gas and uh, oil are, are fossil fuels. And while there has been some transitioning out of coal, for the developed countries, UK uh, as well, and uh, uh, you know EU as well, as well as the US. This transition has largely been to natural gas, which is also a fossil fuel. It is not a zero emissions fuel. Uh, in fact, about almost 50% of uh, UK's electricity comes, I think, from natural gas. So the fossil fuel dependence of uh, developed countries in per capita terms is quite high, significantly higher than India's. And if we and and this is uh, this student of mine, uh, Ankita, it's her work. What she's doing is uh, she uh, is trying to classify countries, reclassify countries based on where they fall in terms of uh, development, not just income, but um, a series of different uh, uh, developmental, uh, uh, you know, categories. If you take different indicators and reclassify countries, you get high development, high equity countries and so on. And so these are some representative countries in this group. So in the high development group, you have about 41 countries that uh, constitute about 18 percent of the global population. There's an average per capita GDP 
an average at a very high HDI level of 0.9 and a per capita energy consumption of about 240 gigajoules per person. This is the UK is lower than this average. The US is much higher than this average. So you have countries in this group that are uh, that uh, uh, are of course both above and below the average and quite significantly so. Then you have medium development and here are two representative countries. You have China and Mexico. Um, you have, uh, you know, we have about 52 countries uh, here um, in this group, 45% of the global population. And we have, uh, again, a per capita energy use, which is slightly lower. And then there is the low developed con low de countries with low development and 41 countries are here, 37 percent of the global population. Uh, India, a lot of the African countries, we are all here. And uh, this the you, you see the per capita energy use and a lot of the other developmental indicators are also significantly less. Per capita energy use is also quite low. Here. So if we take some basic scenarios for India, and this is in, this includes both in terms of top down uh, scenarios as well as bottom up scenarios, as well as some aspirational goals for where India would want to reach in 2035 and 2050. I mean, these are just some target years with some uh, targets that are not just poverty eradication because we have more aspirations than not just not starving, right? So some uh, uh, aspects of well-being, decent work for all. If you include all of this, what would this mean? What evidence do we have that countries have managed to achieve this at lower levels of energy use? And I'm not even talking about emissions here. I'm just talking about energy so far. Where would we have to go from the current or the 2016 value of 23 gigajoules? Where would we have to go uh, to achieve some levels of well-being? And uh, do we need energy to do this, etc. are questions that I think are, are well settled in the literature. We do need energy to achieve level. I mean, there is, uh, you know, uh, th there is a very high correlation between almost all developmental indicators and energy. Uh, that doesn't imply some crude causality of, you know, providing energy and achieving development, but there is a high, uh, in, uh, and that is, I think, well established in the literature, so I don't want to go into that. But if we take, for example, for India, you have different scenarios here. If we take the lower end, let's take the lower end that we go from 23 gigajoules to about 70 gigajoules by 2035. And that's a huge jump. Um, but we go there, let's say by 2035 and to then 120 by 2050, which is where we stabilize. Let's say that's what is required to achieve uh, well-being and we don't need what we don't need to go uh, do what uh, some of the other countries that are high energy consuming, high uh, emitting or, uh, you know, that have required much higher levels of energy to achieve similar levels of development. We don't go that route. Let's say with better technology, more efficient uh, production, we are able to achieve this, not just get our people out of poverty, but also achieve some le decent levels of well-being with lower energy at lower energy levels even then what does this mean imply in terms of emissions even assuming that we improve our emissions intensities we improve uh, we we have more green energy we have uh, we achieve levels basically of uh, emissions intensities of energy that is how much emissions does one unit of energy production uh, get if we if we get to the levels of developed countries today where developed countries are today, you know, given that we have, uh, we we are looking at about 30 years since uh, the negotiations, or almost 30 years since the negotiations on climate change started. Okay, where are developed countries in terms of green technology today? We uh, uh, attempt to get there at least by 20, in the next 20 years, in the next 15 to 20 years. So improve emissions uh, uh, intensities rapidly till then. Even then, what do we have? So these are some trajectories uh, that are compared to what are one point, what would be 1.5 compatible or two degrees Celsius uh, compatible targets, uh, trajectories for India. So for example, 
for every, uh, uh, you know, for the carbon budget available for 1.5, India has a fair share, and that fair share can translate into multiple possible trajectories. You can peak at, uh, we can start reducing immediately and go to net zero sometime uh, close to 2070. Uh, or, the, or we can, uh, you know, continue uh, increasing our emissions peak uh, sometime close to 2030 and then go a little more rapidly to net zero. Or, uh, you know, we can continue to reduce, but reduce slowly and then go to net zero much later and so on. So we have multiple possible trajectories. All the red ones here are uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius compatible for different budgets of 1.5. Uh, the blue tra trajectories that we have are two degrees Celsius compatible. So we have, uh, you know, we can either peak in 2040, go to net zero in 2080 and so on. So there are multiple trajectories possible for one particular value of a carbon remaining carbon budget, the fair share of the remaining carbon budget. And so we can have, I mean, you know, this, these are just illustrative of how many different ways there are to get uh, get to stay within a budget. If we compare this to what India's NDC has currently promised, you see this is uh, India's NDC at, uh, sorry, this is India's NDC. If we, India's NDC is an emissions intensity based NDC. So we have said that we will reduce our emissions intensity by 33 to 35 percent uh, of 2005 levels by 2030. So this is where we are headed. Uh, with if we assume a GDP growth rate of uh, 5%, this is 6% and 7% GDP growth rate. So we are fairly within the 2 degrees Celsius compatible range. If we take uh, the trajectory that I spoke of, the scenario that I spoke of in the previous slide, 23 gigajoules to 70 gigajoules to 40 gigajoules, this is where we will head till 2050. Right? And this is, I mean, you know, so we will have to go to net zero rapidly after that, uh, or, uh, you know, what happens is that we actually have a range of budgets. If we get the full share with the historical responsibility of our carbon budget, then we are very comfortable because uh, that particular emissions dotted line implies an emissions of 220 to 236 giga, gigatons of carbon dioxide. So if India has access to its full share, fair share of the carbon budget, then this is fine. But this requires negative emissions from developed countries. If India has no access to its past fair share, then you know we have we will be overshooting it, overshooting our fair share. But if India has, if there's some semblance of equity in the way in which we measure ambition, okay, then we might have some room uh, to uh, achieve this. And this is. Why I'm showing this is to show the scale of the challenge that India has because we do not have access to the full share of our full fair, our full fair share of the carbon budget, whereas developed countries have had access to more than their fair share. It's because of which we don't have access to our full fair share, and that means that we have a significant challenge on our hands uh, going forward. And you know, uh, this is why there are ambitious targets that have been set by the country. We currently have a target of 175 gigawatts uh, from renewable energy by 2022, that's by next year. 100 gigawatts of which has to come from solar, 60, from, uh, 60 gigawatts from wind. Uh, the Prime Minister has also announced a target of 450 gigawatts by 2030, but this is a domestic target again. Um, However, this was announced, this announcement was made before uh, COVID-19 and there has been uh, the pandemic has taken its toll on, on the economy and there has been an impact on energy, energy demand as well. Uh, but and this has quite uh, uh, serious implications for uh, energy security. What the what kind of uh, systems we would need, uh, especially since this is a power sector target, especially in the power sector. And so I'm going to sp uh, spend the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, few minutes that I have left, uh, about seven, eight minutes, I think I have left, that uh, I'm going to spend them uh, talking about the power sector and the challenges we face in the power sector and the, and the, and the road ahead. So this is where we are today. We have, uh, India has about 16% uh, of its uh, electricity coming from renewables, which is more than what the US gets uh, coming from renewable. 
um, you have, uh, you know, it's similar to, uh, let's say, Russia's share. Um, and, you know, it, we this share of renewable energy, especially in the power sector, is only increasing and increasing quite rapidly because new renewable energy is coming up much faster as compared to conventional power. Uh, you have here France and Brazil are uh, outliers because France, of course, a large proportion of its uh, uh, electricity comes from nuclear. Uh, Brazil has a lot of hydro resources, uh, and so they are slightly different as compared to a lot of the others. So we have about uh, 40 gigawatts already by, this is data for 31st May 2021. We have 95 gigawatts of RE capacity, excluding large hydro. Large hydro is also, uh, uh, you know, is, is considered renewable, uh, but it is not uh, included here. It's not, it's a non-fossil fuel energy source. Uh, so solar has overtaken wind energy uh, already. We have more solar energy now than wind, uh, which is the situation was different in only a few months ago. And while developed countries have transitioned from coal to gas, India is in fact installing more renewable energy than uh, annually than a lot of other developed countries. And if you take Germany, which is the, uh, you know, which is really the uh, darling of uh, climate change, uh, uh, you know, commentators in terms of what they have uh, done for renewable energy. Of course, in the last uh, month, things have changed quite significantly even for Germany. The coal usage has gone up. Uh, because of surge in power demands. And here, uh, what you see is India, in fact, has installed in 2018 more renewable energy than Germany, in fact, twice as much as Germany. Of course, India also needs more energy capacity to be added every year, uh, but that can well come from other sources of energy. But India added 12 gigawatts, 10 gigawatts of solar and 2 gigawatts of wind energy in 2018, uh, which is far more, more than what Germany did. But this comes at a cost. And this is because uh, we have a particular load curve uh, in the country. And you have, for example, um, a lot of the solar energy, which is now dominating, is going to continue to dominate. In fact, increase its uh, dominance in the renewable energy segment, the variable energy segment in the future, uh, largely available in the afternoon and not really available in the morning and evening peak times when the demand really goes up. And so what you need to do is back, you need to have other capacity, conventional capacity available, which needs to be backed down when solar and wind uh, are available. And now this, ha this, uh, this, uh, this means that uh, this also is required because India has a policy of no non-curtailment for renewable energy which means that you must run these plants. All the energy that is uh, generated by these plants has to be absorbed by the grid, irrespective of its cost. So even if you have cheaper um, conventional energy available, you cannot absorb it, you cannot use it, you have to back it down because you are uh, mandated to absorb all of the renewable energy. And so, uh, what this has meant, and because the average cost of solar, while the cost of new solar is lower, the average cost of solar uh, in a lot of the southern Indian states where I live, for example, uh, this is where 50% of India's renewable energy installed capacity is currently. Uh, in the southern states, what this has meant is that they are paying an additional cost. The consumers are basically paying an additional cost to not use cheaper energy sources that are available, but in fact absorb higher cost sources. And for a country like India with a large section of poor consumers, this cost is quite significant. Uh, it leads to a certain amount of avoided cost of carbon, which is which I've listed here, which is over and above the taxes that are paid on fossil fuels. And India has significant taxes on fossil fuels. Coal is taxed at about four to five dollars. I mean, if you if you translate what this means in terms of an effective tax on carbon, uh, the taxes on liquid fuels are very high. There is as high as uh, as about uh, 100 to 120 dollars per ton of carbon. Uh, for coal, it is about you know four to six dollars per ton of carbon, depending on the efficiency of uh, of use of the coal. 
For gas, it is slightly lower, but if you take an average based on the amount of emissions coming from solid, liquid and gaseous fuels, it comes to an effective carbon tax of uh, more than $30, more than $35, in fact, uh, per ton of carbon dioxide that India pays as a carbon that, that collects in terms of a effective carbon tax. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, talk about uh, subsidies in India, fossil fuel subsidies in India, but that's really uh, old, an older narrative. I think people haven't caught on to the fact that, in fact, the taxes on, on fossil fuels are significant in India. And so this leads, what we have in terms of a renewable energy policy has led to some significant costs. Added to it, and this is this does not include balancing cost uh, and other costs that are that are uh, that that come from that are a result of some of these policies, and this is just a comparison. So you have we have uh, um, you know I have compared two states in the U.S. with two states in India. Uh, both all four states, the two in the U.S. and two in India, are, are uh, renewable energy rich states. Look at the difference in per capita incomes. Per capita incomes in the U.S. of course, and both these states are quite high as compared to Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. But if you take a look at electricity charges, you don't see as significant a difference, right? So, for example, Karnataka, uh, you know, the state where I am, uh, we are paying charges, electricity charges that are almost equal to what uh, an average person living in Texas pays, with a huge difference in what uh, an average person earns in either of these states. So there is a significant cost that is being borne by largely consumers who are not necessarily capable of affording that cost. Will new cheaper renewable energy resources reduce these costs? Um, renewable energy costs have reduced, but India has significant uh, uh, constraints in terms of uh, system costs. In terms of storage costs, while battery costs have reduced, they still are they're, they're still quite high, and which means that the total unit cost of renewable energy plus battery is quite high, uh, which means that the costs will be further inflated. Uh, the energy cost will be further inflated. The other issue is import dependence. While a lot of, I mean, you know, if you see the recent IEA report uh, on uh, for India. Uh, you know, based on the world energy model, it talks about how India's import dependence on oil will reduce if it goes green. But it doesn't talk about uh, India's import dependence for solar, for renewable energy technology. Right? For 2019-20, for example, India imported 796 million uh, solar cells, panels and modules worth 11,000, about almost 12,000 crore rupees. And 78% of these imports were from China. And so there is, uh, there are concerns of energy security where uh, renewable energy is also concerned. It's not as if those concerns vanish, um, uh, you know, magically. We also don't have the luxury like uh, Europe to uh, transition to gas because we don't have gas availability uh, and uh, importing liquefied natural gas because pipeline imports are, have even more constraints. Importing LNG is expensive. Uh, hydro is available, of course, not to, uh, to the extent that Norway or uh, Brazil have, but we do have some hydro resources. However, these are geographically very diverse uh, kinds of resources and hydro is multipurpose. We still have a long way to go in terms of improving our productivity, uh, our agricultural productivity. So we need, uh, you know, to enhance irrigation uh, supply. We also need, uh, uh, you know, most of these reservoirs are multi-purpose, uh, drinking water purposes as well. So there are constraints on hydro use. Uh, some of the developed countries have also, I mean, you know, uh, Germany, of course, has uh, decided to withdraw from uh, from nuclear. But, uh, you know, the other, the, some of the other developed countries do have uh, significant dependence on nuclear. Uh, similar dependence uh, for India is difficult. There are financial constraints along with other constraints. Uh, which again, I won't go into in this talk. So unfortunately, in the near term future for the power sector, uh, there is, it's very difficult to envision a move away from coal. However, 
that coal has to be clean coal. There have to be steps that uh, that are taken uh, for progressive retirement of older plants based on parameters. And some of my colleagues at my institute have done a study uh, on this. These parameters have to include environmental parameters. The new focus uh, has to be on uh, the investment for new focus has to be in be on clean coal, supercritical plants, ultra supercritical plants, advanced ultra supercritical plants. And the focus has to be on air pollution, really, because that is a serious domestic problem that we have and we have to address it. And another uh, significant result from the IPCC is that uh, we should avoid a lazy conflation of air pollution and mitigation policies while there is there are, there's likely to be some overlap and, and connections. You need separate strategies and policies to be able to address uh, air pollution uh, effectively, to be able to control air pollution. Uh, then simply uh, assuming that if you do mitigation, it will automatically lead to air pollution control as well. Secondly, our capacity has to increase. There is no doubt about it. We need to increase our capacity in a phased manner. This has to be based on our capacity to absorb that renewable energy while we enhance our manufacturing capabilities. A target based sort of deployment and pressure to deploy more and more renewable energy without looking at what its impacts are on, uh, you know, what is what its developmental impacts are is going to be a problem. We are already facing uh, significant challenges, especially in the power sector where some of these targets are uh, being implemented as of now. And we really need to focus on domestically available resources. Uh, you know, a lot of, there is there is again very strong uh, emphasis on technologies that will in, in enhance that will increase import dependence for India, such as battery energy storage systems, for example, uh, as opposed to pumped hydro systems, which can play a key role for balancing and storage. And so some of these things, uh, you know, what happens when you have this kind of high pressure, uh, you know, coming because there is a big uh, COP26 uh, that is around the corner, uh, the, the a, a discussion on what kind of flexibility do we need, what kind of targets are possible, what is it that the country can do, cannot do, what are our uh, challenges, this Conversation unfortunately gets scuttled in all of this uh, sort of responding to pressure uh, from countries that really uh, have no business putting pressure, uh, if I may say so, because we really are very far from, I mean, some of these countries, the rich countries who should have taken a lead so far, have only continuously changed the goalposts, have continuously delayed action and have pushed it further and further into the future. So that now, what we need, and I'm ending uh, here, is uh, we really need uh, uh, for India especially. What has happened? I'm sorry, something, uh, my, I think my slide, something has happened to the slide. Oh, there it is. Uh, the, the, we, we need a, we need to understand the challenge for countries like India, not just India, the developing countries as well is quite big, is enormous. I cannot emphasize this enough. Pressurizing India to keep doing more is inequitable, it's unjust, and this is being done through different reports that are being published. Uh, those of you who are following some of these will uh, know this. India and, and other developing countries need to urgently focus on development. This is important for adaptation because we are looking at a world that is higher than 1.5 degrees Celsius. However much we might be uh, want to dance around the issue, that's where we are headed. And so we really need to look at uh, what our developmental requirements are, because that's where uh, uh, it's important for adaptation. It is not enough to simply say that we need more, uh, that you know, we need more action and we need more action from everyone. Uh, you know, uh, low income countries also need to do more, but their uh, commitments can be conditional on finance. If we look at what the record is on climate finance, it is dismal. And what we are looking at now is a reframing of the entire uh, understanding, the narrative on climate finance, where there is much more focus on private finance and equity flows. And so we are basically, uh, the developing countries are expected to pay the developed countries to mitigate climate change, 
uh, which they haven't caused. So it is really uh, a sort of a, a, a you know if you if you think about it in the, in in terms of equity, the entire uh, focus is quite perverse. A lot of the developmental indicators that I showed you uh, show that the differentiation that that was enshrined in the UNFCCC is still very relevant. So it is. That, that that is the reason why less developed countries require some flex flexibility. This is not flexibility without any action. It's not as if you know they, they, should, they can't do anything, especially countries such as India need to take adequate action. There is no doubt about it. Okay, but this has to be understood that this uh, the idea of flexibility has to be understood also based on the track record of developed country in action on multiple fronts. Uh, but some some leeway to be able to try uh, strategies also perhaps fail, you know, improve, use, uh, try different uh, technological routes, etc. That flexibility is required uh, required as we develop because we are also uh, our economy is also rapidly changing, structurally changing. It's not reached uh, the levels of stable the kind of stability that developed countries see. Even there you have rapid changes, especially when crisis uh, happens. You take the global recession or you take the pandemic. For countries like India, it's even more. And so whatever action we are uh, now talking about, either in terms of NDCs, uh, climate commitments, long-term commitments, short-term commitments, near-term commitments, these have to be measured using equity as the basis. This is the only possible way forward that does not put the burden of saving the world on the backs of the poor, uh, poor nations and the you know the poor populations within those nations. I think uh, I will end with that, uh, and I hope um, you know, I've been able to provide at least some understanding of what the challenges are for India as it goes forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tejal. Um, that was really great. Uh, you can stop sharing if you want. If you want to leave it on, that's fine. Um, you know, sort of just walking us through that the arc of cumulative emissions and what net zero actually means and the emissions that we need by when and by whom, and then also sort of Indian energy and the, the intricacies of that. So I might kick us off with one question and then, uh, but I will um, I will ask everybody to write their questions in the chat and then I might read them out or might ask you to come in and, and sort of read them out yourself. We have a few, but I would encourage a lot more questions. Um, so, so just to start, Tejal, I mean, you know, there's the COP is sort of, right here and you know you make a very powerful case about the need for equity and you lay out you know that sort of if there was a reasonable semblance of considering equity within you know within what happens next then india has a certain amount of you know room or budget to be able to develop which would take us to sort of reasonable standards of per capita energy consumption right can you say a bit more about what that actually means, right? What is like, what would you like to see happen um, that would be reasonable where that, you know, where to the last point you made right now about, you know, that anything credible has to be backed in equity. What, like, what does that actually look like? And what would it mean? And what would it take for you to be sort of, you know, to say that this is, this is a fair outcome? Uh, you mean in terms of, uh, I mean, I think the clarification you need, it, yeah, in, the, in terms of uh, the COP. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things I think uh, would be useful definitely is uh, to have, um, we have discussions on the global stock take, for example, that are uh, coming up and are open. Um, how is it that we take stock? Um, how uh, much focus do we put on? One is, of course, uh, you know, pre-2020 pledges. Where are countries in terms of meeting them, right? Um, Kyoto is gone. Uh, what about the, you know, other pledges? Even the, you know, the, even though the pledges are, I mean, absolutely inadequate. Even those inadequate pledges have people, uh, are people on track to meeting them? And of course, and for a lot of countries, the answer is a resounding no. So, uh, you know, given all of that, 
how do we think about near term action instead of simply pushing goalposts further and further talking about 2050 which nobody has seen what about 2030 how do we measure and of course you know that is one of the places one of the areas where um, equity and science are still alive in the paris agreement uh, the the article 14 on the global stock take for example uh, of course there the guidelines uh, to dilute some of this emphasis a little bit but nevertheless it still is there and so uh, that's the that's 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 the only uh, thing that can in some sense uh, put some objectivity back into this discussion in terms of what the challenge really is. The focus unfortunately is going to be largely on Article 6 on uh, market mechanisms, trading, um, and the buying and selling of carbon, I mean, you know, credits. Uh, but unless you actually have entitlements, I mean, what do you trade if you don't have entitlements? And the NDCs don't translate to entitlements. You don't really have and so there is a lot of debate about how what what role do private entities have here everybody is talking about uh, you know private players also having uh, also being able to trade carbon credits but do these then get considered as country ndcs or some independent action so there's a lot of there are a lot of open the um, questions there as we go to the cop but a lot of it is i i, I fear is directed at um, pushing the burden of climate action on countries that actually need to get geared up for protecting themselves from in a world which is going to be a greater than 1.5 degrees Celsius world. And, uh, you know, I that's that's about, I suppose, uh, you know, without, without going, go, going on too much about it, but uh, that's, I think, where I, I would expect at least on a global stock take, there is some sort of pushback in terms of equity and trying to, uh, you know, get some of these metrics right. Right. So to paraphrase global stock take and then pre-20, I mean, pre-2020 might be, um, it might be wishful thinking in some sense, but, um, but, but, but even so in terms of, you know, what you think would be a reasonable, a reasonably fair outcome. Those are the two places where, um, where some measure of of incorporating historical responsibility. We are, we are talking about uh, the, all of this relative to how bad it can actually be. So the relatively uh, reasonable outcome you know, would is not something that we would uh, celebrate necessarily, but at least something. Right, right. That's very helpful. So. Uh, 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 Robin, if I can invite you to to ask a question, this one sort of goes into um, it goes into cool generation. But uh, why why don't you ask Tejal directly? So Tejal, and again, thanks. again, if I can ask the audience to put more questions in, that would be great. Thank you very much, Radhika. That's great, and I really enjoyed your context. It's uh, very easy to be sat here and imagine. It's just our own uh, position that is the frustrating thing that we need to deal with. Uh, what I was asking really is thinking about the larger transmission distances in India, typically from a coal fired power station to a uh, place of demand, energy demand. Actually, every watt you can remove in terms of energy demand now could in fact have a larger abated CO2 than if you apply energy efficiency measures in an area that has either lower transmission losses or a greater penetration of renewables. So the question is, should we actually focus some international effort on energy efficiency as being a way of bringing some of the carbon out of the system more quickly? So this isn't the long term view. This is just perhaps some short term easier wins. And, you know, why am I naive about that question? So please educate me. No, no, I, I that's a it's a it's a no brainer really to folk i mean you know to to get as much as we can out of energy efficiency initiatives um uh, and uh, there has been a lot of focus in india uh, to do this uh, you know if you see gov the government communications to the un uh, at least half of the report is on energy efficiency initiatives and this is both at the supply side at the, at the, side, at the on the side of the power plant as well as uh, you know industrial use and uh, things like that 
And there is, of course, a lot that uh, that can be done there. Uh, some of it, of course, is also an issue of the very nature of production in India, especially in some sectors that you have a lot of small scale fragmented production in the small and medium scale, especially in industry uh, where achieving levels of scale where then you can get uh, you know, commensurate returns in, in terms of energy efficiency initiatives is itself the first challenge. So, uh, you, so while you can you can do this in sort of large integrated steel mills, what do you do with the huge number of small spongy and units uh, that uh, you know with, that are spread across the countryside? It becomes a little difficult, much more difficult to do this. But nevertheless, you know there are cement plants, for example, that have managed to do. Um, managed to achieve efficiency gains at scale, uh, lower scales of uh, production as well. For the recycling industry, plastic industry, this becomes slightly more challenging. Uh, some sectors are easier, domestic buildings, etc., slightly easier because you can have targeted measures uh, there, especially by income categories. Uh, industry is a little more tricky if you go one step lower than the large the large uh, industry and that's already covered in government programs. It's the small informal uh, industrial setups that uh, are a challenge and they, they constitute a large proportion of India's industrial production. Thank you, that's really, really helpful. Thanks, Robin. I might ask um, Anshuman if um, if he's on to to come in next. So Anshuman, I'll give you a, a a couple of seconds to respond. Otherwise, I will read out your question. OK. Um, I don't hear anything, so maybe, maybe he's not able to, to turn his camera on. But let me read it out for you, Tejal. So the question is about green economy, green growth, and the feasibility and benefits for developing countries, right? And um, and I think what he's saying is that that Currently, the literature available talks about the transition to the green economy with having short term negative impacts. Um, but if we look at long term positive impacts, then um, positives like green job creation, observe the transition from tradition to green jobs through government interventions. Not this literature doesn't really focus on developing countries, right? And and so within the context, say of India or of or of a larger context, larger sort of you know sort of emerging economy, how feasible it is to move towards these sort of green economy measures, um, and still have those additional benefits that are socio-economic, um, you know, and 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 sort of around labor and employment, and and you know, and then he goes down to there's another question by him sort of following up, which is to say, you know, how does that work when coal is basically responsible for providing most of that quality of life? Yeah. No, so uh, that is an entire uh, section that, uh, you know, I actually didn't uh, cover at all. Uh, and it is very important. Uh, thank you. So thank you very much for the question. Um, it is one is of course the immediate impacts uh, on labor so you know before i go there you know let me say that it is really when we talk about just transitions there is a lot of literature now and the un itself has a lot of submissions on just transitions um, uh, from the ilo from uh, you know different perspectives uh, but uh, for developing countries a lot of the ldcs uh, in india included it really isn't a transition like it is for the developed countries. The developed countries are really transitioning in the, in the, in the, the true sense of the word. But for the developing countries, we have not carbonized to decarbonize. We have not even carbonized to half the extent of developed countries. And so you have huge sectors, large sectors of the economy that are still uh, dependent on very basic, uh, you know, sort of technologically backward forms of production. Right. And so the challenge, therefore, is to now we, we have no evidence that this can be done without the kind of fossil fuel driven growth that was possible, uh, that made it possible in the industrialized countries. Right. And so how do we uh, go about doing it? So that is the first uh, challenge. The second uh, is that uh, we have, while we talk about labor, uh, you know, 
what happens to labor that's currently employed by the fossil fuel industry. And of course, this includes, let's say for a country like India, it would include um, coal miners, uh, uh, thermal power plant workers, railway workers, because you know railway freight in India, for example, uh, contributes the largest proportion of freight transport for the Indian railways. And so a lot of the railway revenue in India comes from coal. Um, and so you have, uh, so you have that and you have the entire for some regions in some states, the entire local economy is driven by uh, renewable energy, uh, sorry, by, by the fossil fuel industry, by coal. And you may not have an exact overlap, even if we speak of green jobs, where those green jobs are. So, for example, in India, the coal is concentrated in the eastern uh, region. And the renewable energy is potential is concentrated in the southern and the western region. So you are not going to have a commensurate shift, even if we are talking about it in terms of a shift. So there is regional disparity there. And locally, for the local economy, almost the entire economy is dependent on, uh, let's say, a particular in a, in a mining region, a coal mine. So what do we do? So the, a transition and a plan that includes that understands. Uh, I mean, you know, that, that speaks about mitigation from the perspective of justice domestically as well as internationally has to think about this. It's not simply a matter for the developed countries, the uh, wage compensation that it would require to actually support retraining and reabsorption of coal workers in other industries is a much smaller proportion of their total GDP as compared to what it would be in countries like India would be huge uh, to do this. Um, and so, I mean, that's an entire different challenge that I have not spoken about at all uh, in, in this talk. And so, um, you know, I could go on about it, but <laughs> but I, I unfortunately don't have an answer. I don't uh, I don't know. I, I can speak about what the challenge is, how to deal with it. I really am not sure. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very fair, actually. Um, Tanvi has asked a question about subsidies. Tanvi, are you able to ask yourself or I can read it out? I, I can ask it. Um, uh, hi, Tejal, thanks for your presentation. Um, you alluded briefly to uh, some of the conversation around subsidies and, and taxes, and I was wondering in, if you could give us um, your take on sort of what uh, that looks like across the different sectors, as well as for those of us trying to understand priorities at a national and state government level, do you think uh, looking at subsidies and taxes is a fair way of understanding what uh, governments are prioritizing? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, let me answer this. Answer the second question first. Uh, that uh, yes, I mean one should look at uh, you know taxes and uh, subsidies, but one should look at it. Unfortunately, what has happened is if you look at the uh, you know publicly available data in terms of uh, if you think about it in terms of carbon taxes, right? What is classified as carbon tax is what countries explicitly call a carbon tax. So if I just rename some of the excise duty that is imposed on coal as a carbon tax, it will get classified as a carbon tax. Otherwise, it doesn't get uh, you know it doesn't come into the list of what is considered as a tax. But in, in, on liquid fuels, for example, India has some of the highest fuel taxes uh, in the world. And so you can actually um, translate that to what it means in terms of an effective tax uh, on carbon. And you see uh, and you compare it with if there if there are any fiscal uh, benefits that are provided to fossil fuels. And, and, and you know, I really think that this is something uh, that has to be that uh, that that people need to understand, especially global commentators on uh, taxes. And, I, and let me just uh, name, for example, the Climate Action Tracker recently released its uh, uh, its, its updated study, right? And there they have rankings for different countries. And what they say is India does uh, poorly on some indicators because it subsidizes its uh, it subsidizes both renewable energy and fossil fuels, but if it reduces fossil fuel subsidies, uh, it will do better. But where are 
are these fossil fuel subsidies? I mean, how is it that people, you know, that, that we don't see them? Where are they? I mean, if you actually compare the amount of taxation on fossil fuels and all this, these taxes, not all of this goes into, I mean, I'm not saying that it goes directly into green development. It goes into all kinds of other things. So, for example, you have agricultural cess, you have a road and infra infrastructure cess, uh, on fuels, you have a coal cess, you have a GST on freight, you have multiple things that constitute you have royalties that states charge that then they refuel into welfare expenditure, right? And so you have a lot of these, but but a tax nevertheless, nevertheless, nevertheless inflates costs and so depresses demand and so has the effect of acting as a deterrent for carbon to, uh, for the for using uh, carbon based uh, fuels, and so therefore. Uh, it becomes, it is, I mean, what we should in fact do is compare what kind of taxes, how much is the base price, the cost of production the, and the cost of, uh, let's say, distribution of a, of a particular fossil fuel and what are the taxes and calculate what it effectively means in terms of carbon taxes across countries and then to, and, and that would be a better comparison of how much countries actually disincentivize the use of fossil fuels. Uh, then simply sort of calling something that you levy a carbon tax because you know uh, that might be just someone small proportion of the larger chunk of taxes uh, and things like that but uh, uh, you also asked about what is the, you know the, the the role of the state and the center and the, the, the levy taxes for very different reasons and they are used for very different reasons so that also becomes uh, i think important I mentioned uh, freight uh, transport. One of the things that often gets missed when we speak about, uh, you know, subsidies on fossil fuel is that, for example, I mean, let me just, uh, you know, coal, like I said, coal freight uh, contributes the largest amount to the revenue uh, of the Indian of Indian railways. Now, this freight transport subsidizes passenger transport in the railways. Right. So you they paid more than it actually costs to transport that coal so that it subsidizes passenger transport. Now, rail based passenger transport is is a green initiative, but we don't consider this as a subsidy for uh, public transport, uh, whereas it, in fact it is right. So some of these things, uh, if uh, you know, it, if, if they are studied, I mean, uh, they should be studied. Uh, I mean, I wish there was enough time. Uh, in the day to be able to do all of these studies, but I mean, I would really encourage people to look at some of these things closely. Thanks, Tejal, and that's such an important point, which you know all of us know, but when in many often don't think of, right, as sort of a subsidy for green. I mean, that's a that's sort of a green measure. It's but but then on on the back of what, right? That's that's the question. Okay, so Gaurav has asked a question about scenario frameworks. Gaurav, are you able to ask it yourself? Okay, let me let me read it out. Don't you feel that dominated scenario frameworks like SSPs or IA are modeled as per Annex 1 conditions, neglecting the constraints and trade-offs in non-Annex countries? How do you envision a transition scenario for India? So it's a modeling oriented question. Um, around what that transition scenario would look like for, um, you know, if we if we didn't assume the the assumptions and the context that come for Annex One countries. No, it begins. I mean, I think the um, problem uh, begins much before the assumptions. Uh, the problem begins with the framework of the model, uh, the models itself. These are all integrated assessment models uh, that are modeling energy scenarios, economic parameters and variables way into the future. They're talking about 2100, 2200. I mean, I don't know how many some of these models were done in 2015. You know, we should see how many of them predicted a pandemic. Um, in 2020. So, I mean, of course, you know, you have uh, discontinuities that model that cannot be modeled, but uh, the framework itself uh, that uh, that sort of uh, in some sense uh, tries to do some kind of uh, welfare, global welfare maximization uh, by by looking at costs of abatement across countries without looking at what these costs of abatement mean in terms of the proportionate income of those countries itself in, in the in the first instant 
instance, you know before you even look at the results, is going to mean a higher mitigation burden for developing countries. You simply say it's cheaper to mitigate there, let's mitigate there. It's more expensive to mitigate in our countries, let's not, so let's mitigate there. That's what a least cost um, uh, scenario would look like and that's what it, uh, that's what the results show. You know it before, I don't have to model it to, to, to know that that's the result that it's going to give. But what does that mean? If it costs me $10, uh, $10 is a proportion of my income versus $15 is a proportion of income for somebody who lives in uh, the US, is a, is, is, there's going to be a huge difference. And so that's the, that's the first thing. The second is, of course, the assumptions, right? And you have, what do you do when you have a largely an informal economy with increasing levels of productivity, large scale structural shifts, from primary sectors of production to secondary sectors of production. How are these things even considered? You know, increases, uh, you know, poverty eradication is one thing, but increases in incomes uh, and what that means in terms of, uh, you know, jobs, employment, all of this. How does, how do these models consider it for economies like ours that are very rapidly changing? So I agree uh, definitely that these are really dominated uh, by Annex 1 conditions. Even if you assume that equilibrium conditions apply uniformly to Annex 1 uh, you know, economies, which they don't. But even then, you can get some, some perhaps reasonable results for the near future. But, uh, um, you know, otherwise, I mean, some of this is really, it's like, uh, you know, if I'm talking about what uh, kind of, you know, meeting this GDP, for example, the SSP scenarios, SSP 1.9, talk about GDP conversions in 2150. In 21, I mean, I, I'd say that, okay, you know, we'll, have, we'll find some planet to go and dump our carbon dioxide in by 2150. I mean, I, it is as absurd as saying something like that. So, you know, that's a... <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to go down that path, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, you know, Radhika can add quite significantly <laughs> to, to that, to the critique of these models. So let me move to the next question, which is um, so Hugh has asked a number of questions. So Hugh, are you around to ask them yourself? OK, so, um, you know, the one I'm going to take is about uh, solar and batteries, and he's he's asking, you know, are um, are villages so rural areas being are using are they using solar panels and batteries more than being connected to the grid so i thought you can use that as a you know we can use that question as a way to just think through what's happening in in, in sort of the rural context around grid connection and access to energy so there are some uh, remote villages so we india's had a remote village electrification program for quite some years and uh, there are of course uh, there you have decentralized, you either have mini grids or you have decentralized uh, uh, schemes that are implemented and grid connection is really not the focus. But uh, the idea is to take the grid everywhere because uh, that is what will lead to reliability and sustainability in terms of costs because uh, you need some kind of diversity in the system, especially if you want to encourage uh, productive activity uh, in rural enterprises because it's I mean, to assume that, uh, you know, the village, I mean, if you provide some four hours of lighting um, and, you know, perhaps some cooling here and there, and it's going to be fine, it doesn't work. Uh, many, many years ago, we had a student who actually did study some of these, um, you know, remote village electrification programs in one of the northern states, Himachal Pradesh. Uh, and so these are really, some of these areas are inaccessible and, uh, they were uh, and she after she did she did her field work there and after she did her studies she in fact uh, decided to title her thesis and and those who understand hindi um, in the, in the audience will understand this she titled her thesis ye asli bijli nahi hai it means that this is not real electricity and that's the overwhelming response she got from the the villagers they said that this is this is a stop gap. This is a temporary arrangement. The grid is going to reach here. And once that comes, that is the real electricity. This is not real. Right? So people need, want electricity for more than just lighting. They want it for productive use, for agricultural purposes, multiple things. So uh, can we do this with only mini grids and decentralized systems? Um, 
it is a little more it, it is more difficult right? for some areas of course it may make sense and so but as a sort of a rule that applies uniformly to uh, rural areas across the country you know? Yeah, that's that's really interesting, actually, because they're competing narratives on that and also different and different countries are thinking about this differently, right? OK, I'm going to try and squeeze in one last question from Damien, who's put in his question twice. So um, if you're around, you would you like to ask it yourself? This is about cooling and air conditioning. Um, OK, let me read it out. So it would take India until 2050 to fit air conditioning into half of all households. Could you talk through the challenges India faces in staying cool as the world warms up, give, particularly given air conditioning's large emissions? Um, yeah, overall. So, what's the solution? Yeah, it's a um, you know that's a the cooling demand is some, one of the fastest growing demands in India um, as incomes increase. That is the first segment of residential demand that goes up. And so cooling demand is going up rapidly. Um, and uh, so, you know, it would mean that we have to think, I mean, the government already, I mean, you have schemes of uh, star rating and efficiency, high energy efficient uh, uh, air conditioners and, um, uh, you know, building designs there is a building code uh, there is a there is a revised green building code that india has and of course there there's a lot of gap between the policy as well as and the implementation but hopefully that will improve over a period of time but there are a lot of initiatives on in in, in terms of energy efficiency uh, for air conditioning but beyond that i mean unless the electricity that uh, um, goes into um, one you know one thing to do is to deal with the electricity that drives the air conditioners that takes care of one part of the problem uh, you have green energy but then you have emissions from the coolants used in the air conditioner and the refrigerators and so um, you know un un unfortunately to a certain extent i mean given what the kinds of solutions that the developed world has seen on some of these those are the ones that are going to be implemented uh, in our countries as well uh, it's not going to be very different as compared to that uh, you know of course uh, i mean you know unless we find something radically different to keep ourselves cool or, or to keep ourselves warm uh, you know, some kind of solar and reverse pumping and things, you know, some kind of technological solution. I'm not hopeless when it comes to uh, technology, but uh, uh, we shouldn't hedge our bets on technologies that we don't yet have. So we should do what we can with what we have um, and hope for the best for the future. Robin, I see you answered. Maybe I'll hand it over to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were out of time. Thanks. Thanks, Sejal. Um, on just on the cooling question, I would I would um, sort of say the Oxford Martin School Future of Cooling program is doing a series of eight cooling for COP webinars that answer a lot of those questions. So so that would be a, a place to look. But Sejal, thank you so much, and Robin, um, yours. Well, thanks very much to Tejal and to Radhika as well, and thank you for everyone for those questions. I'm sorry we don't always have time to to cover them all, but I think we had a really good conversation going there. Just a very quick advert. Uh, next week we will have an event in person and online, and uh, Anya Beerwitz, if I pronounce the name correctly, from the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Energy and Environment, will be talking about energy sufficiency in buildings and cities. So I hope some of you at least will be able to join us for that. Please also sign up to receive newsletters from the Energy Network. Hopefully Anne will be posting the links in the chat there. But yes, thanks again. And I just feel so much better educated on the challenges that we all collectively face in, in humanity. And uh, we, we need research like uh, both of you doing to, to try and find the best path forward. So thank you both very much indeed. And I hope you both enjoy all enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.